come up and take a look.
shot.
one second.
This is an ABC News special report celebrating President George Herbert Walker Bush. Now reporting, George Stephanopoulos. Good afternoon and welcome back as we continue to honor President George H.W. Bush. There you see the hearse carrying his casket pulling up to the United States Capitol right now. All of official Washington coming out, a military honor guard as well to say farewell to the president who they worked with over the course of a remarkable 40-year career. Served in just about every branch of government, not a judge, but he was in the House, the President of the Senate, CIA, Chair of the Republican National Committee, eight years as Vice President, four years as President, and now he will be celebrated in the U.S. Capitol with leaders of both parties. And also you see there at the top of the steps the men and women he served with who served with him when he was President in his cabinet. Military honor guard in place. David Muir, World News Anchor, is inside the Capitol right now as the President's family is also being escorted in. They're, they, of course, made the trip with him on Special Air Mission 41. That's what Air Force One was called today in honor of the 41st President of the United States. And David, as I said, he will be celebrated by Republicans and Democrats from the House and the Senate. No question, George, he's being welcomed back to Washington, the nation's 41st president. A remarkable scene playing out here in the nation's capital. It is golden hour as the sun begins to set here on truly a beautiful, beautiful early evening here in Washington for the return of President George H.W. Bush. George, as you know, he so often shied away from answering that question, how would you like your legacy to be defined? He was uncomfortable with that question. Part of that was what his mother had taught him, not to speak about himself. Uh, but he did say that I hope that I'm remembered for what we did right. I did make mistakes, but we often did things right. And that reflected uh, George Bush when he said, I made mistakes, we did things right, referring to his team through the years when he served as president and as vice president to Ronald Reagan, of course. Uh, we also know that Barbara Bush, before we lost her, spoke about how she would like her husband to be remembered and she said that he was the most honorable decent wonderful man i'd ever met nobody has ever been as lucky as i've been i want people to remember him as courageous i want them to remember him as he is i think she would be proud of how a nation is coming together to remember a kind gentle a moderate politician particularly in these times and certainly we hope the former president would be proud of the demonstration uh, already in Washington and and the outpouring of support we've seen across the country, George. Tributes coming in from across the country, around the world. His fellow military, those who served in the military, the defining experience of President Bush's life, he said, his time as a fighter pilot when he was shot down at the age of 20 over the Pacific. And now the military honor guard, every single branch of the service represented there to greet him. We see Laura Bush and of course, President George W. Bush, number 43, who made the trip with the president, with his father across the country today, the rest of the family. That is Major General Michael Howard, the com commander of the commanding district in Washington, D.C., who has been in charge of these funeral preparations. 21 gun salute to follow. Honorary pallbearers for the president will be the captains and admirals who commanded the carrier group in his name. There at the top of the stairs, as I said, Vice President Quayle, other members of his cabinet, including his chiefs of staff, John Sununu, Sam Skinner. The family is going to be going in privately into the chows. And Cokie Roberts, he will lie in state, the president will lie in state 
before the state funeral on Wednesday, a hallowed tradition going back to Abraham Lincoln. Actually to Henry Clay. Uh, he was the first and because he was in the Congress, of course, Speaker of the House, famous Senator and Secretary of State, but he was in Congress when he died. And so they brought him to the rotunda. And But then with Lincoln, what happened was his funeral was in the East Room of the White House. And the day before, 20 thousand people came through the East Room. So they set another day of viewing at the Capitol, built this catafalque that, that President Bush's coffin will lie on for President Lincoln so thousands more could come to the Capitol to see him uh, before he was taken to Illinois. And as you were noting as we were watching the motorcade come in, perhaps not 20,000, but people lining the streets to see yes. the motorcade come through Washington yes. today. And I, I suspect that as the night wears on and people come all night, it's remarkable into the rotunda. Uh, and as the night wears on, I suspect that you will see many thousands. Uh, and the family, I, I suspect, will also be keeping watch. You know, they, they have been keeping watch uh, for months now. And uh, the last time Laura and George saw him, as far as I know, was at Barbara Bush's wedding, where they, Laura Bush told me they kissed him goodbye. The casket will now be brought up the steps. Our congressional correspondent, Mary Bruce, out there. Remarkable tableau, Mary. Absolutely, George. And I have to tell you, it is eerily quiet out here right now in what normally is quite a, a boisterous uh, area on the east front of the Capitol that has been remarkable over the last hour or so to see just a steady stream of dignitaries arriving, mayors, governors, members of Congress, uh, justices from the Supreme Court, members of President Bush's, uh, members of his cabinet, as well as members of the current cabinet, all coming uh, to pay their respects, to be part of this ceremony. We are going uh, to hear later, of course, from the leaders uh, of Congress, the Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, House Speaker Paul Ryan, and the Vice President, who arrived not long ago. He will be uh, the only member of the current administration speaking here today. And, and as Koki mentioned, this, of course, is also a chance for the public to come and pay tribute. We are seeing them starting to line up here as well. And the Honor Guard has reached the casket. After the call to present arms, we'll hear hail to the chief. President's family now being escorted to the top of the steps as well, led by President Bush. His son Neil as well. His granddaughter Jenna there. What a lovely sky this evening. Koki, they knew this day would come, but you see the wear on George W.'s face there. And there, uh, on the other side of the general, is Doro Bush, Koch, Koch, and she uh, is, really was at her father's side for months and months. And uh, this is, this is very hard. He's 94, you knew you were going to lose him, he's your dad. And it's hard. Especially in the same year you lose your mom. Laura saying what we're all thinking, what a beautiful night.
more light in the present, know what's going on. Second 21 gun salute of the day for President Bush. And now this is the US Army Band, Pershing Zone, playing as he's brought up the Capitol steps. Ready to stop. Ready to stop. Ready to stop. 
I'll be placed on the casket will now be placed on the Lincoln catafalque. This Pershing Zone plays its hymns, and I want to bring in Terry Moran. What a somber and grand ritual we're witnessing right now, and so much summed up in the face of President George W. Bush there. The emotions of a father, a son, and a president. What a beautiful moment. You're absolutely right, George. Uh, president George W. Bush, who I covered for several years, I asked him once what he got from his dad that helped him the most in the White House, and he said, unconditional love. Uh, his, his father was enjoy, a man who enjoyed being a father, and his children are reflective of that. I'm also struck in this beautifully solemn moment of the military character of it. George Herbert Walker Bush, a graduate of Yale University, uh, from one of America's uh, wealthier families, joining, enlisting in the Navy as young as he could. You don't see that much anymore. Uh, he represents a generation that, that did seek out public service. Uh, less than, fewer than 1% of the graduates of the Ivy Leagues today, the Ivy League today, go into the military. It was a different generation, a different set of values, and that is one other thing that I think we are celebrating and remembering. And so close to President Bush himself, we were talking about this earlier today, Terry. Uh, one of his wishes to be wearing those socks commemorating his time as a fighter pilot. It was, as you pointed out, the defining episode of his life. One asked of all the great positions that he had held, vice president, member of Congress, head of the CIA, envoy to China, businessman, what prepared him the best for being in the Oval Office, he said without hesitating, getting shot out of the sky in September 1945. He was tested. We're seeing President George W. Bush, Jeb Bush, of course, Neil Bush, and the other Bush children now filing back in uh, to the Capitol. In Cokie Roberts, it was service of all kinds, all kinds that George Bush celebrated. But his public service and public and elected office started right here, started in this building, um, representing a a Houston district that was safe Republican, no way to know that he would go on to such heights, uh, that here we are in the rotunda of the United States Capitol. There's the Bush cabinet filing in right now, General Colin Powell, of course, William Barr has served as Attorney General. General Powell yesterday called President George H.W. Bush a perfect American because of that commitment to service. John Sununu served as White House Chief of Staff as well. Boyd and Gray as White House Counsel. Lamar Alexander, now a Senator, the Secretary of Education. You know, there, there, there are many huge paintings in this rotunda, but the most significant of them is that of George Washington giving over the military command at the end of the Revolutionary War, the signal that the civilians would rule this country. So in the middle of all of this beautiful military pageantry and, and celebrating the place of the institution of the military in our society, it's still the civilian rule that made the difference in the, in the Constitution. And this ceremony, a military ceremony, but every detail gone over by George W. Bush, H. W. Bush himself. Be sure that every note of music you're hearing, he picked. David, you're quite an image there, that empty catafalque waiting for the president. And a powerful image, George, to think about uh, the family that will walk in uh, with the casket. Uh, bearing their father on his return trip, his final trip to Washington. You know, he wrote when he enlisted in the Navy as a, a young man to the woman he met at that Christmas dance, Barbara Pierce, uh, what a wonderful mother she would make one day. And I love that story that uh, former Secretary of State James Baker, former Chief of Staff as well to President George H.W. Bush has been sharing in recent days. He told you as well, George, uh, that he was one of the last to visit President Bush at home uh, he recalls being there on Friday and the president opening his eyes and asking, where are we going? And he said, we're going to heaven. 
going to heaven, Hefe, which was what he called the president after the president left Washington. That relationship, that friendship, so consequential in American history. They met in Houston back in 1970, I believe. James Baker had been widowed. George Bush reached out to him. They became tennis partners' friends. And Baker was a Democrat. Was a Democrat <laughs> then, managed all of George Bush's campaigns, as David said, went on to become Chief of Staff and Secretary of State, and has been remembering his friend. Uh, Koki, not only we talked to him yesterday, but I also remember three years ago preparing for this day, speaking to James Baker. He broke down even then. And, and, and Susan Baker, his wife, also uh, you, the eulogist, other than the family and the historian, at Barbara Bush's funeral, very, very close to each other, the two families. But you know, it goes back, these relationships. When Robin died, their daughter, the person who came constantly to be with them and to help them was Lud Ashley, who was a Democratic congressman for many years. And, and those kinds of friendships, there's nothing like that kind of a friendship. When you're with someone in a terrible time in their lives, you become closer friends than ever. And James Baker, certainly that happened with him. And then he changed that relationship, as you say, changed the world. The two of them together negotiated their way through the end of the Cold War. There we see the Capitol Rotunda, Vice President Mike Pence, Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, outgoing Speaker of the House, Mitch McConnell, Republican leader of the Senate. They will all speak in this memorial service for President Bush. Members of the Supreme Court, of course, also there, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Breyer, Justice Thomas, all of official Washington coming together today for George H.W. Bush. The honor guard exits. The invocation will now be delivered by the chaplain of the house, Reverend Patrick Conroy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for the appearance among us of great men and women who serve as inspirations for all Americans to be their best in service to God, country, and neighbor. This day, we honor our 41st President, George H.W. Bush. President Bush dedicated his entire life to public service as a vocation, first in the military, then as a member of Congress, a diplomat, director of the CIA, vice president, and finally president. It is a record of service reminiscent of John Quincy Adams and unmatched in nearly a century. We thank you, O oh God, for having endowed President Bush with noblesse oblige and ask that his example of service to others might be an inspiration to all Americans, indeed to all the world. As we continue this celebration of honor, grant that all who attend to these proceedings might be desirous of being our best selves in service to all our brothers and sisters, as you might call us to be. Dear Lord, thank you for inspiring such greatness in President George H.W. Bush and continue to bless the United States of America. Amen. That was the Reverend Patrick Conroy. Now we'll be hearing from the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell. Thirty years ago, on the west front of this Capitol, George Herbert Walker Bush addressed the nation for the first time as our president. He said, we meet on democracy's front porch, a good place to talk as neighbors and as friends. The words of a humble servant who loved his fellow citizens and of a principal leader who knew America not only guards our own future, but also safeguards democracy for the world. Today, this hero has returned to the Capitol a final time, not on the front porch of our democracy this time, but here in its hallowed cathedral. Beneath paintings that tell the story of our land and our liberty, and flanked by statues of his fellow champions whom he joined in making that story possible. George Bush was just a teenager when he volunteered for military service and became the Navy's youngest aviator. He was only 20 on that September day in 1944 when his plane was hit on a bombing run. But through the fire and smoke, George Bush stayed steady at the controls. Only once he accomplished his mission did he parachute out over the Pacific. A steady hand staying the course. That's what George Bush gave us for decades. Decorated aviator, congressman, ambassador to, to the United Nations, envoy to China, CIA director, eight years as vice president, and our commander in chief. Through the Cold War, and the Soviet Union's collapse, he kept us on course. When the rule of law needed defending in the Persian Gulf, he kept us on course. With his even temperament and hard-won hard expertise, George Herbert Walker Bush steered this country as straight as he steered that airplane. He kept us flying high and challenged us to fly higher still. And he did it with modesty 
and kindness that would have been surprising in someone one-tenth as tough and accomplished as he was. The patriot who lies before us was blessed with many gifts, but there was no doubt which he prized most of all. A great love story began at that Christmas dance when George Bush met Barbara Pierce, and the grace and virtue they taught their children have enriched this nation through a family of leaders. Today, the nation stands with that family, with our 43rd president, with Jeb, Neil, Marvin, and Doro, and all the Bush grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We stand with you in mourning, but also in gratitude. Gratitude for lives well-lived and duties thoroughly fulfilled. Gratitude that God gave this country George and Barbara Bush, and that they may now be reunited in the light of his grace. <laughs> Mitch McConnell speaking with a steady hand, staying the course through a remarkable career. And now we will hear the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. As Americans, we have no more solemn duty than laying a great patriot to rest. Here lies a great man. To the Bush family, on behalf of the whole House, Republicans and Democrats, we are profoundly sorry for your loss, and we are honored to celebrate this wonderful life with you. Like so many, I feel a personal debt of gratitude today, a sentiment no doubt countless millions of Americans are feeling at this moment. The 1988 campaign, that was the first one I was ever involved with. We handed out literature at the Janesville Craig Cougar Ball Games and at the Rock County 4-H Fair. <clears throat> I remember going to this big rally at Miami of Ohio the day after the first debate. The whole experience really drew me into politics. He was the first president I had the chance to vote for. And he was the first president to teach me and many of us that in a democracy, sometimes you fall short. And that how you handle that, that is just as important as how you win. An old preacher once said, grace is but glory begun and glory is but grace perfected. Grace is but glory begun, and glory is but grace perfected. Glory is transcendent in the life of our republic. This rotunda is a trumpet call to glory. Tributes to the giants all the way up into the sky. Grace, grace is different. It's more elemental. It is not larger than life. It is the stuff of life, the connective tissue in a free society. It deepens the well of our common humanity. Throughout his life of service, President Bush personified grace. His character, his character was second to none. He reached the heights of power with uncommon humility. He made monumental contributions to freedom with a fundamental decency that resonates across generations. No one better harmonized the joy of life and the duty of life. There's that indelible image of him as Commander-in-Chief during the Gulf War, waving to a sea of troops during a visit during Thanksgiving. 
There are all these images we have of him as a devoted husband. That twinkle in his eye that Barbara always brought out, especially in those big, huge family photos you all had in Kenny Bunkport. This one I, I will never forget. There was that image of him as a loving father reaching out to hold his son's hand at the National Cathedral after 9-11. There's this letter he wrote his children on the last day of 1990 as he wrestled with a decision over Operation Desert Storm. He begins by recounting the family Christmas and he apologized if he seemed distracted. I tried not to be, he writes. Then for about a page, he elaborates on his struggle over sending young Americans into harm's way. Twice in the letter, he writes, every human life is precious. And the original copy, he adds by hand a note wishing his family a new year. In consequential times, George Herbert Walker Bush demonstrated the finest qualities of our nation and of humankind. A great leader and a good man. A gentle soul of firm resolve. He showed us that how we live is as important as what we achieve. His life was a hymn of honor. His legacy is grace perfected. His memory will belong to glory. God bless the 41st President of the United States. That was the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, and now representing the administration as we see that remarkable mural on the ceiling of the Capitol. We will hear from Vice President Mike Pence. Speaker Ryan, Leader McConnell, Leader Schumer, Leader Pelosi, members of Congress, distinguished guests, but most of all, President George W. Bush, Governor Jeb Bush, Neil, Marvin, Doro, and the entire Bush family. It is deeply humbling to stand before you today at the beginning of a week in our nation's capital when we will commemorate and celebrate the lifetime of service and leadership of the 41st President of the United States, President George Herbert Walker Bush. The Bible tells us to mourn with those who mourn and grieve with those who grieve. And today, on behalf of the First Family and my family and the American people, we offer our deepest sympathies and respects to your family. And we thank you for sharing this special man with our nation and the world. Today, President Bush becomes the 32nd American to lie in state in the United States Capitol Rotunda. Soon, Americans from every corner of the country and every walk of life will make their way to this rotunda to pay the respects of a grateful nation. Upon the death of Abner, it is written that King David said, Do you not realize that a commander and a great man has fallen in Israel this day? George Herbert Walker Bush was such a man. While he was known as the quiet man, it was not for lack of nerve or daring. For in all of his 94 years, President Bush never lost his love of adventure and he never failed to answer the call to serve his country. Born into a tradition of public service, George Herbert Walker Bush began his own life of service when he was still in high school 
After the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, he wanted to do his part, so he enlisted in the United States Navy on his 18th birthday. On receiving his wings, he became the nation's youngest naval aviator and was sent to the South Pacific, where his story almost ended. September 1944, on a bombing raid over Chichijima, his aircraft was hit, his engine caught fire, but he still managed to hit his target before bailing out and being rescued by American forces after some four hours at sea. All told, he flew 58 combat missions, and for his bravery under fire, he earned the Distinguished Flying Cross, which would have been enough honor for any American life. But George Herbert Walker Bush was just getting started. After he came home, he staked his claim to a booming post-war America by making a name for himself in the oil business. For four years, he walked these halls as a congressman from Houston. President Nixon took notice of the young Texan and asked him to be our ambassador to the United Nations. He led our party during a tumultuous time for the presidency. And after earning the respect of another president, he did the work of a diplomat as the first United States envoy to China and led the CIA. And then, for eight years, George Herbert Walker Bush served as the 43rd Vice President of the United States. I'm told as he was preparing to become Vice President, he once joked about the job, saying that there was, quote, nothing substantive to do at all. <laughs> but as history records, during those years, he set the standard as a sound counselor and loyal advisor to an outsider who came to Washington, D.C. to shake things up, cut taxes, rebuild the military, and together they did just that. And then, in 1988, he made history again when George Herbert Walker Bush was elected in a landslide as the 41st President of the United States of America, becoming the first sitting Vice President to win the presidency in more than 150 years of our history. He served during an uncertain time in the world, made momentous by his leadership. President Bush oversaw the fall of the Soviet Union, the crumbling of the Berlin Wall, and under his leadership, America won the Cold War. He took our nation to war to repel aggression in the Persian Gulf, and through his leadership as Commander-in-Chief and the brilliance of our armed forces, the United States won a decisive victory. When President George Herbert Walker Bush left office, he left America and the world more peaceful, prosperous, and secure. President Bush was a great leader who made a great difference in the life of this nation. But he was also just a good man who was devoted to his wife, his family, and his friends. I was lucky enough to meet him in 1988 when he was vice president. And I was a 29-year-old just getting started in politics. Then, as always, I was struck by his approachability. There was a kindness about the man that was evident to everyone who ever met him. All his years in public service were characterized by kindness, modesty, and patriotism. He was so modest, in fact, that he never wrote an autobiography. But he did leave a record of his life in the thousands of letters that he wrote. I'm told that he started writing letters to his parents when he was 18 years old. And over time, his circle of correspondence grew to include family, friends, advisors, staff, business associates, former presidents, and just about anyone who would take the trouble to write to him. After a lifetime of writing letters, my son got one just not too long ago. As I told two of his sons this weekend, 
When our son made his first tailhook landing as a marine aviator on the USS George Herbert Walker Bush, I took the liberty of writing the ship's namesake to ask for a small favor. I didn't write him as a vice president to a former president. I, uh, I just wrote as a proud dad of a marine aviator to a former Navy pilot. I asked him to sign a picture of the flight deck that I could give to my son. Now, we were told by the staff that the president had long since ended the practice of signing autographs, and we understood that. But little to my surprise, just in time for my son's winging, there came not only a signed photograph, but, of course, a letter hand-signed as well, August 2018. In that letter, President Bush wrote to my son in his words, congratulations on receiving your wings of gold. I know how proud you and your family are at this moment. And then in words that assured us that the letter came directly from him, he wrote, quote, though we have not met, I share the pride your father has for you during this momentous occasion and I wish you many C-A-V-U days ahead. All the best, G. Bush. I would come to learn that that acronym, CAVU for short, is a term Navy pilots have used since World War II. It stands for Sealing and Visibility Unlimited. President Bush described CAVU in his words as the kind of weather we Navy pilots wanted when we were to fly off our carrier in the Pacific. And he once wrote a, a letter to his children saying that CAVU, in his words, describes my own life as it's been over the years and as it is right now. Sealing and visibility unlimited. You know, that may well describe the essence of this man, and it may well have been his vision, the vision he had for his life, for his children, his children's children, and his country. No barriers, no boundaries, no limits. So we mourn with those who mourn and grieve with those who grieve. But we do not grieve like those who have no hope. For President George Herbert Walker Bush had that hope. His face sustained him throughout his life of service, and, and we pray that faith will be a source of comfort for all those who mourn the loss of this good man and great American. President George Herbert Walker Bush loved his family and he served his country. His example will always inspire, and his lifetime of service will be enshrined in the hearts of the American people forever. May God bless the memory of George Herbert Walker Bush. May God comfort his family and friends. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Vice President Mike Pence recalling that naval fighter's phrase, sealing and visibility unlimited CAVU. That was also the code word used to inform the Bush family that their father and grandfather had passed. And now we will hear from the U.S. Naval Academy Glee Club.
This will be the laying of the wreath by the Senate, Democratic and Republican leaders. Senators Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer. And now another wreath will be laid by the House Speaker, Paul Ryan, Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. And now for the administration, Vice President Mike Pence will lay a wreath, of course called George H.W. Bush his role model as Vice President. <clears throat>
Vice President, accompanied by his wife Karen, will now pay respects to the Bush family. And we'll hear again from the U.S. Naval Academy Glee Club. <laughs> And now the benediction will be delivered by the Senate Chaplain, Dr. Barry Black. Let us pray. Eternal Father, strong to save, in whom we live and move and have our being, we praise you for your generous providence that provided our nation and world with the gift of your servant, President George Herbert Walker Bush. Lord, we're grateful for the privilege you gave us to learn and grow from his integrity, kindness, heroism, courage, excellence, service, intellect, humility, civility, and spirituality. As we celebrate this well-lived life, challenge us, O oh God, to also leave the world better than we found it. Continue to comfort those who mourn. Touch each member of the Bush family with your mercy, love, and grace. And God, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world lies hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and a peace at last. We pray in the name of George Herbert Walker Bush's savior and friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dr. Barry Black, the Senate Chaplain. And that concludes the ceremony. The
family will now pay their respects. The Capitol Rotunda will open to the public at 7.30 p.m. tonight. Stay open all through the night, 35 and a half hours up until the state funeral on Wednesday. President Bush. <coughs> We saw a little twinkle there from George W., first one of the last hour. I think he's been having a very hard time getting through this as, as well as he might, but, but it was kind of a, a goodbye dad uh, moment. But you know, this is the time when the public gets to say their respects, and it's quite extraordinary. There he will lie under the fabulous mural of George Washington in heaven, the apotheosis of George Washington and thousands of people will come in and and people of all different types all walks of life i remember lady bird johnson who sat for a while with lyndon johnson's coffin saying that an anti-war protester came in and said to her i'm sorry we were so mean to him ma'am and that kind of thing happens it's a reconciliation of people who didn't like him and a an admiration of the people who did and uh, it's America coming together to honor a leader, and a, as we've just heard over and over, and not just a great man, but a good man. And celebrating the good we've seen in that man. Terry, Terry Moran, I was listening to Paul Ryan talk about the lesson he took from George H.W. Bush, lesson about how to handle defeat. It reminded me of the words that the president wrote in his diary that night, be kind, be generous of spirit, let people know how grateful you are at probably the lowest moment of his political life, always conscious of his duty to, duties to the public and his duties to himself. And, and that character, uh, that old tried and true American values that he learned in his family and at his schools and just in and of himself and in whatever relationship he had with the Almighty, uh, that helped him rise up from that uh, devastating defeat. And that rising, his post-presidency, uh, was distinguished and, and kindly as it was. Obviously, his son was elected president. Uh, all that growing out of that, that decision that one has to make in moments of crisis and in moments of, of defeat, that this won't be the last chapter, and it wasn't. Mary Bruce there on Capitol Hill. We're celebrating a spirit very far removed from the one you cover on Capitol Hill every day right now. Yeah, and George, I have to say, I was struck earlier as we watched out here as the casket of the former president was brought up those steps that if you looked, the windows of the Capitol were filled with the faces of staffers peeking out to get a look at the former president as he arrived here for the last time. And there have been so many reflections this week about the lessons that this Congress and those staffers can take from the legacy of President Bush. He has been hailed uh, and will continue to be, I, susp I suspect, a as a real icon of bipartisanship, something that is lacking very much here uh, in the halls of Congress today. And there's a real sense as you talk to leaders, uh, members of Congress uh, who knew President Bush, who worked with him closely, that that, that political era uh, may be ending, that now there is a void uh, in our political discourse of that kind of unifying leader who had the political courage to, to reach across the aisle and forge those kinds of relationships that for President Bush uh, we know lasted throughout much of his life. David Muir, the second time now in as many months that we've seen two Americans who so many Americans revere lie in state in that capital. John McCain, President George H.W. Bush. No question. And they represented the finest of America, George. And, you know, as Mary just pointed out, uh, President Bush was known for his bipartisan efforts. Uh, and in a time uh, that we're witnessing in this country, it's uh, sort of hard to imagine the sort of moderate stance he took on so many issues. But he also represented something else in this country, and that is, you know, a love of family. He was a family man. And in the description of those final hours on Friday, uh, James Baker there in the home and some members of the family were there but for those who weren't there were phone calls from so many of his children who did have a chance to talk with their father uh, before he passed on Friday and the last phone call was George W. Bush uh, who told his father you have been a great dad I love you President Bush saying back I love you too extraordinarily powerful moment George certainly was and we're gonna have many more coming 
after the public pays their respects. Of course, we will have the state funeral at the National Cathedral on Wednesday morning. And Amy Robach back in Houston uh, right now, a celebration of the former president there tonight as well. That's right, George. It's 7 p.m. here in uh, Houston. There will be a free concert. You hear the Houston Symphony here behind me rehearsing tonight. The Houston Symphony, Yolanda Adams, the Gatlin Brothers, Kay Walk Clay Walker, all musical artists who have a connection to the Bush family will be performing here tonight. Thousands of Houstonians are expected to attend to honor the life of George H.W. Bush. It's really beautiful here this evening. And people who attend are asked to bring colorful socks. There will be a donation <laughs> and recipients will be from the Meals on Wheels program here in Houston as Christmas gifts, of course, honoring that life of service that was so important to George H.W. Bush, George. Signature president. Push those goofy socks. Amy Robach, thanks very much. We're going to sign off right now. There you see the scene in the Capitol right now. President Bush will lie in state. We will cover all of the events around this. Of course, we will back, be back, as I said, on Wednesday morning for the state funeral at the National Cathedral. Until then, have a good night. This has been a special report from ABC News.